Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, Magnetic Reversal News, and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum update Friday, November 5th, around 9 p.m. Mountain Time, 2021. We're here live at La Palma, which, as predicted, appears to be going quiet. Now, there is still some inflation occurring, and people are speculating that this is just a buildup for a big explosion, but we're sticking with the facts, and <laughs> we're watching the eruption closely. But the big story is snow. Ho, ho, ho. Could be a Minnesota blizzard coming in just a week, bringing the heaviest snow to the Northeast. That's the big story. Antarctica's last six months were the coldest on record. That means ever. Keep calm. It's boom time. Over 100 million Americans under cold weather warnings as temperatures drop and they're plummeting in the east, the coldest place in America. A solid base for snowfall may have set strong backcountry base where snow still remains. And this is the Sierras looking good for a banner snow season, one of the best maybe in decades. Great Lakes have a fever as first lake effect snow sets a record. Mind blown. The first lake effect snow of the season dropped nearly a foot of snow. Ho, ho, ho. Near the Great Lakes shores on Tuesday into Wednesday, the snowfall was enough to transform parts of Michigan Lower Peninsula into a winter wonderland and break into the record books. Snow totals topped 11 inches in northern parts of Michigan. Gaylord, Michigan picked up 11.7 inches of snow Tuesday, which set a record for the heaviest snowfall in any calendar day in November. A November to remember. That amount also ranked as the sixth highest single day snowfall in any month ever since records have been kept at the National Weather Service. In Gaylord, which is 225 miles north of Detroit, and just to the east of the upper reaches of Lake Michigan, we've got this, well, time lapse video for you. So, record snow falling up in that region, which is good news. Now, Smokies also see the first snow of the fall season, which is good news. For the East Coast, bad news is more is coming. Nobody's bumming. Well, Alice, shut up now. Get in your home. I told him to go to bed early. No butt cake. So what we're looking at here rolling out is heavy snow in the Northwest. Let's just pause this up. This is through Tuesday. Let's just back that up for you. So as we enter the weekend here, what we're going to be seeing here on Saturday is Heavy snow moving into the high elevations of Oregon and Washington and the eastern ranges of the Cascades. Some snow moving into the northern Sierras there in California and snow dumping into Idaho and western Montana. Sunday morning, that snow is going to push into Wyoming. More snow is going to be accumulating up to two feet of snow by Sunday afternoon in Washington State and in the Cascades in Oregon, up to a foot or more in the Sierras by mid-Sunday. And that snow is going to move west. And a second clipper is going to bring additional misery where the snow totals could go up to four to six feet in Washington state, around 46 inches in uh, Oregon here. And we're looking at 16 to 18 inches in the Sierras. This uh, is also going to bring snow to the southern Rockies, central Rockies, and the northern Rockies. So the entire Rocky Mountain front. Now, what is the setup here is November 11th into the 12th. Another This clipper is going to create a low, which drops down here and then moves over to the east. And that system is going to explode over, well, say it ain't soda, Minnesota. And it is soda. So if that stays correct, and this, these totals are getting higher and higher, and it's more accuracy in here. Uh, so we're going to be watching this as it progresses. Another clipper is going to bring this east and bring a heavy system, the largest system, as far south as George, snow in Georgia and Mississippi, potentially by mid-November. A November to remember, kids. Mark my words. Brrr, it's cold. The coldest place in North America is the East Coast. And the coldest place in the U.S. is the Northeast, like a beast. Eastern Canada getting as low as 15 degrees currently. But this is going to move into sub-Arctic. And it's not over for the Northeast. Here we walk through your Saturday night. It's going to be freezing there. The coldest spot is going to be up here in northern Washington State and the entire northeast tomorrow, tomorrow night. And the cold will linger on through Sunday and the rest of the weekend. It'll warm up in the east, but it's going to get cold in the west as we move towards that system. Here's the setup. Wednesday, 
Thursday, subarctic air in Wyoming, in central Idaho, it's going to be sub-zero. We could get down to minus 10 with wind chills in minus 20, maybe minus 30. Wind chills at minus 10, maybe in Colorado by November 11th. Mark my words, it's going to be very cold where we are right here, sub-zero by Friday. And this is that plume of cold air that's going to sweep east like a beast and bring, well, that heavy snow here to Minnesota. Say it ain't so that Michigan could be picking up some totals. Hello, Top Knot, but take a look at the subarctic air in Minnesota right there. Wow. It's going to be chilly. This is all going to push east here into the Appalachians overnight. Look at those temperatures, 23 degrees, 26 degrees. Oh, did I say Texas is going to freeze before that? I missed that right there. Boom. Texas is going to be freezing by Friday, November 12th. Hello, Friday, November 12th. You're freezing in Texas, the nexus of the Schmexus. So we're watching the first plumes of subarctic air moving through the east like a beast. There's Wednesday, November 17th. You better have your triple fat goose on. Does anyone know what that is anymore? Eruption leads to temporary closures of Torrealba volcano in Costa Rica. Yes, those people were actually walking on the rim when this baby blew and they've shut it down for a few days. Well, to preserve the lives of onlookers. We have a lot to report on tonight and very little bandwidth. We're really being hammered here. But let's move on to uh, with the podcast, the La Palma Canary Islands eruption. Uh, we showed you the live footage. Let's go over some of the information. Here we're at some of the deformation there where they see an uplift now happening. This could be anomalous like it was in days past. But certainly observational science will say that the volcano is shut down. There is no effusive nature at night. There's no glow at the vent. There's no huge fountaining, no strombolian activity. And both the visible eruptive activity at the vent and the lava flows as well as internal seismic activity have been lower today overall. And those are the facts. So we just keep a close eye and watch it without speculating. And let's just refresh the seismic tremor. And you can see that it now for about three and a half days, it has fallen well below this threshold from the normal eruptive activity. It is in a quiet phase. And you can see it clearly if you go look at uh, the volcano. Not only that, if you look at the data. I just brought up the last all the earthquake information over the last 24 hours, and it's the lowest since the eruption began, just 2337 quakes from two to four magnitude. That's it. The biggest quake in 24 hours, just a four magnitude. Everything is still dropping down. And you can see here from the 3D quakes versus depth that almost no seismic activity has been occurring at all over the last 24 hours. Just a few dozen quakes. That's it. So we're keeping a close eye on the volcano for your benefit. And let's just go over there full screen live and take a look at it for about 30 seconds. Now you're looking at the SO2, which is still being generated and it's still flowing over all of Northern Africa up into Eastern Europe, it appears. This is some of the seismic tremor happening. This is some of the larger actual earthquakes as opposed to the tremor, these drop down spikes. But what we can glean from the live stream is that there is still lava flowing and a lar large amount of lava there to come out before this is over. Anyone's guess how long it takes to push all the lava out from the magma centers. But with reduced seismicity, there is a, not a lot of uh, magma being in place based on the data, no matter what anyone tells you. Those are the facts. Now, what we should be worried about is Karimshkai over in the Kamchatka Peninsula. Powerful eruption with huge ash cloud drifting over the Pacific happened about 36 hours ago. No one reported on it except Volcano Discovery. This is a huge plume. Could be a VEI-2 eruption all its own from this puff. It's just such in such a remote area that the only da data we get is from Himawari. Yes, these high-altitude satellites. Two powerful explosions occurred at the volcano from its crater 36 hours ago. Huge, dense ash clouds with dimensions of 400 by 560 kilometers and 280 by 80 kilometers, respectively, were reported. These are huge plumes. And there's still more booms going on. Because we, here we are at Worldwide Volcano News Update. 
Kadimsky is the top of the list, still puffing and passing with ash aloft to 18,000 feet. So we have uh, other volcanoes on the plate, not just the one that everyone is obsessed about. <laughs> Let's talk about Iceland real quick. Let's look at the whole country. Earthquakes in the last 48 hours. We've been keeping a close eye on Ashja up here, and well, it does not disappoint. There is another little cluster of seismicity happening on Reykjanes and Ashja tonight again. Um, and what does that mean for you? Well, for those that don't watch the show regularly, um, this screen is white because it has no information on it. Oh, there it is. Ashja. You ask you a question, I'll give you an answer. Ashja Volcano. The eruptive history is quite spectacular. No, it's VEI2, but back here, this is what we're worried about. Yeah, the Dalton minimum eruption of VEI5 at the caldera. Another VEI5 back around 10,000 years ago. Well, actually 11,000 years ago. Does that sound familiar? So this is a grand solar minimum volcano. This is a magnetic reversal volcano. This is a large calderic volcano that can blow to VEI5. Is it boom time? Well, it could be. The spread and the amount of seismic activity and the scale could be setting up for a VEI5 calderic explosion from Ashja volcano in Iceland coming soon. To a boom near you. Now, examining the 1,800 plus young volcanoes in the U.S. Southwest is a hobby of mine, which is why I moved out here seven years ago. And I have visited dozens of not only the calderas and the cinder cones, but also the lava flows on the surface. And there are there's so much recent volcanic activity here. It definitely has something to do with the. Uh, the end of the empire, let's say, when all of the Pueblo people made a mass exodus around 1300 AD here. Well, the volcanoes in the southwest were erupting about a thousand years ago. That would put it at about a thousand AD. So stuff got really bad down here and they probably wanted to pick up and go somewhere nice to vacation, in my opinion. And when we have time, we certainly will do an expose on some of these youngest volcanoes in the U.S. Southwest that most people are completely unaware of. Tens, if not hundreds of square miles of the surface of the earth in the Southwest where we live right now were covered with lava flows in the recent geologic past. And I'm not talking millions of years. I'm just talking hundreds, thousands of years, not hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands of years ago. Just a thousand years ago, there was major volcanoes erupting in Arizona and New Mexico. <laughs> you learn something new every day. It might as well be something of importance. Now, Minnesota treated to some vibrant northern lights, as well as South Dakota and everywhere that was above 47 north latitude. They picked it up and we're going to put it down. Take a look at the northern lights in Minnesota from the most recent geomagnetic storm that we reported on. Just about two days ago, it was big, and we said it would be, and it did last. KP7 lasted for nine hours, KP6 lasted for six hours, and KP5 for three. Overall, the entire geomagnetic event lasted for about 18 hours, instability total, 24-hour event. Now, this isn't the type of event that would shut down the grid. We'd be looking for KP9 for three of these spikes, a drop down in another pulse at KP9, and a drop down. That could be a grid ender. That would take an X10 or greater uh, directly facing us, which would be associated with multiple CMEs. And so this is a nice event because it's only M flares and they took, called it a cannibal. All that means is that the M flare was faster than the previous CME. So it's two CMEs caught up with each other and create a big plasma wavefront causing this instability. So that's about all that happened there. And it was beautiful for people watching the Northern Lights. The Aurora even, electric universe, say, call it what you will, but it was glorious. Yes, and we have the footage and I searched it right here on the Googler. Here we have some amazing footage coming up from Scandinavia from that geomagnetic storm. We have some footage parsing up here from Alberta. Beautiful. More Canadian footage 
around the Calgary region, they had this really yellow green event. You can see some purples and reds to the left, but imagine if this was your farm or your ranch. Spectacular. And to get a shot of it, glorious. And now we're going to be coming over here to the closest to our home, South Dakota. And this is in the Black Hills, where some of the most spectacular mammalian fossils are found right above the dead dinosaurs. And this is glorious. Just the scientific knowledge and the pictures. Well, just fantastic. Now, world food prices are up 30% in a year. And this is a warning that we've been giving for half a decade. If you're not properly prepared with three years of food for your loved ones and your family, you're not doing yourself, well, peace of mind. Give yourself peace of mind. Think about some long-term food storage and some preparedness issues because this is not going to get any better anytime soon. And that's a boom. Let's look at the advertising. I can't even get that off the screen. So. Check out our link below for My Patriot Supply for 25-year shelf life food for long-term storage. Go to the supermarket, buy some rice and beans and canned goods, and get yourself a stockpile of food and get it started. Time is running out. It's only getting more and more expensive, and that's what it would only do. Unless you have Shiba Inu, I don't know what you will do. Now, let's look up. November to bring two meteor showers and an eclipse. And if you're in North America, if you're in the U.S., well, you, most of us are going to see it 100%. Now, let's talk about the two meteor showers first. That's the Taurids and the Leonids. For the Taurids, uh, look in the constellation of Taurus in the eastern sky. How many meteors? Six per hour. That's pretty lame. That gets a three out of ten. I would agree. Now, the Leonids, you look in Leo for the head of, of the lion. You're, you're looking for 10 to 20 meteors per hour, and that gets a 5 out of 10. But for the big show, we're talking November 18th to 19th lunar eclipse. Now, here are the details. You may get downloads. It will be awesome. It's free, and all you have to do is go outside and look up. The entire eclipse is visible in central Alabama, so good for you guys. Most of the moon's face dips into the deep part of the Earth's shadow, and boom! We have the entire map. No, we don't need your help. This is the map of the partial lunar eclipse for November 18th to 19th, which is going to be visible in all of eastern northern Siberia and Russia, <laughs> all of Alaska, all of Canada, and everyone but the northeast. They can suck it. It's going to miss out here in North America. Coming all the way down through Mexico into Central America, even my friend who's in Costa Rica right now is going to be picking up a pretty good amount. If you're anywhere in this dark pink, you're going to see the full event. And all you have to do on this map that I'll link you below at time and date is to click on your area approximately. See, I just clicked on the map and it gave me Denver. It'll tell me the beginning starts um, at 11 p.m. The partial begins at midnight 18. The maximum of the eclipse is at 2 a.m. Partial ends at 3.47 a.m. and the penumbra ends at 5 a.m. where I'm at. So I'm in the most awesome spot in the entire eclipse, which is why I moved here. Well, actually, California is a little better. But obviously, Pagosa Springs is a billion times better than California on any, even their best day. And that's boom to knowledge. Why would you want to be surrounded by all those communists? Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Share this with like-minded people. Be safe. We love you. Hope you got something out of the video. We do this because we love you. Mm.